Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to lesson number six in the series on Genesis. It's titled The Roots of Abraham. It's ready for teaching on May 7 and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 30. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And this week, as we look at part of the story of Abraham, that man who figures so much in the history and the thought of three of the world's great religions, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. May we see the faith that Abraham had as the sort of faith that we need as well. And may we know that at every step of the way that Jesus is right beside us. And we thank you for his sacrifice that was exemplified in the approach that Abraham took. And Lord, as we open your word, there are people who are still struggling with COVID around the world. There are still people who have loss as a result of that. And today I'd like to specifically pray for them and for churches who are grappling with the issue and for communities that are struggling and for people in need as a result. And I pray that wherever we are, whether we're in Bangalore in India or Osaka in Japan or Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and Lord, I thank you for that beautiful little church there in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and Dublin in Ireland and Denver in Colorado and Karatha in Australia and Lima in Peru and Kigali in Rwanda and Jamaica in the Caribbean. Lord, wherever we are listening, wherever we are studying your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit we're there to not only bless us in our study, but to comfort us and help us in our daily lives. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Let's read that again, Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. We have now reached the centre of the book of Genesis. This central section, chapters 12 to 22, will cover the journey of Abraham from God's first call, Lekka, Lekka, go, in Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. Which leads Abraham to leave his past, to God's second call of Lekka, Lekha, go, in Genesis 22, verse 2. Then he said, Now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. Which leads Abraham to leave his future, as it would exist in his son. As a result, Abraham always is on the move, always a migrant, which is why he also is called a stranger in Genesis 17 verse 8. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. In his journeying, Abraham is suspended in the void, without his past, which he has lost, and without his future, which he does not see. Between these two calls, which frame Abraham's journey of faith, Abraham hears God's voice, which reassures him, Do not be afraid, Genesis 15, verse 1. These words of God mark the three sections of Abraham's journey, which will be studied in weeks 6, 7, and 8. Abraham exemplifies faith, as we read in Genesis 15, verse 6, And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him 
for righteousness and is remembered in the Hebrew Scriptures as the man of faith in Nehemiah 9, verses 7 and 8. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites and the Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. In the New Testament, Abraham is one of the most mentioned figures from the Old Testament. And this week, we will start to see why. Sunday, May 1, Abram's Departure. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Why did God call Abram to leave his country and family? How did Abram respond? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So... Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was sixty-five years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. The last time that God had spoken with a person, at least as recorded in the scripture, it was with Noah, to reassure him after the flood that he would establish a covenant with all flesh, as we've previously read in Genesis 9, verses 15 to 17, And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh, The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth, and that another worldwide flood would never come. God's new word, now to Abram, reconnects with that promise. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through Abram. The fulfilment of that prophecy begins with leaving the past. Abram leaves all that is familiar to him, his family, his country, even a part of himself. The intensity of this going is reflected in the repetition of the key word go, which occurs seven times in this context. Abram has first to leave his country, Ur of the Chaldeans, which also is Babylonia, as we read in Genesis 11, verse 31, and Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there, and Isaiah 13 verse 19, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. The call to go out of Babylon has a long history among the biblical prophets. Isaiah 
Chapter 48, verse 20. Go forth from Babylon. Flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing. Declare, proclaim this. Utter it to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. And Revelation 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Abram's departure also concerns his family. Abram must leave his heritage and much of what he learned and acquired through heredity, education and influence. Yet God's call to go involves even more. The Hebrew phrase lek leka, or go, translated literally, means go yourself or go for yourself. Abram's departure from Babylon concerns more than his environment or even his family. The Hebrew phrase suggests an emphasis on himself. Abram was to leave himself, to get rid of the part of himself that contains his Babylonian past. The goal of this abandonment is a land that God will show him. The same language will be used again in the context of the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22 verse 2. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. To refer to the Mount of Moriah, where Isaac will be offered and where the Jerusalem temple will be built, as you read in Second Chronicles 3 verse 1. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. God's promise is not just about a physical homeland, but about the salvation of the world. This idea is reaffirmed in God's promise of the blessing for all nations. As we read in Genesis 12, verses 2 to 3, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The verb baraka, B-A-R-A-K-H, bless, appears five times in this passage. This universal blessing for all people will come through the seed of Abram. As we read in Genesis 22:18. in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And Genesis 28 verse 14, Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The text refers here to the seed that will ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, as we read in Acts 3.25. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So to finish the day, what might God be calling you to leave behind? That is, What part of your life might you have to abandon in order to heed the call of God? Monday, May 2, The Temptation of Egypt. Read Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 to 20. Why did Abram leave the promised land to go to Egypt? How did the Pharaoh behave in comparison to Abram? Genesis 12, beginning at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai his wife, 
Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was, when Abram came into Egypt, that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife, take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife, and all that he had. Ironically, Abram, who had just arrived in the Promised Land, decides to leave it for Egypt because there was a famine in the land, as we read in verse 10. Evidence of people from Canaan going into Egypt in times of famine is well attested in ancient Egyptian texts. In the Egyptian teaching of Merikari, a text composed during the period of the Middle Kingdom, 2060 to 1700 BC, people coming from Canaan are identified as miserable Asiatic, that's A-A-M-U, and described as wretched, short of water, he does not dwell on one place, food propels his legs, which is a quote from Miriam Lichtheim's Ancient Egyptian Literature, Volume 1, The Old and Middle Kingdoms, pages 103 and 104. The temptation of Egypt was often a problem for the ancient Israelites. Numbers 14 and verse 3, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 18, And now why take the road to Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Egypt thus became a symbol of humans trusting in humans rather than God, as we read in Second Kings 18 verse 20. Now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, on which if a man leads, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. And Isaiah 36 verse 6 Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust him. And verse 9, How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? In Egypt, where water could be seen on a daily basis, Faith was not necessary, for the promise of the land was immediately visible. Compared to the land of famine, Egypt sounded like a good place to be, despite what God had said to Abram. The Abram who now leaves Canaan contrasts with the Abram who left Ur. Before, Abram was portrayed as a man of faith who left Ur in response to God's call. Now, Abram leaves the promised land by himself of his own volition. Before, Abram relied on God. Now, he behaves like a manipulative and unethical politician who counts only on himself. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 130, During his stay in Egypt, Abraham gave evidence that he was not free from human weaknesses and imperfection. In concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife, he betrayed a distrust of the divine care, a lack of that lofty faith and courage so often and nobly exemplified in his life. End of quote. 
What we see here then is how even a great man of God can make a mistake and yet not be forsaken by God. When the New Testament talks about Abraham as the example of salvation by grace, it means just that, grace. Because if it weren't for grace, Abraham, like all of us, would have had no hope. And so to finish the day, what should this story teach us about how easy it is even for faithful Christians to stray from the correct path? Why is disobedience never a good choice? Tuesday, May 3, Abram and Lot. Read Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 to 18. What does this story teach us about the importance of character? Genesis 13, beginning at verse 1. Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants for ever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord." Abram returns to where he was before, as if his trip to Egypt were a mere unfortunate detour. God's history with Abram starts again where it had stopped, since his first trip to the Promised Land. Abram's first station is Bethel, as we read in verse 3, just as in his first trip to the land in Genesis 12, verses 3 to 6, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Abram has repented and is back to himself. 
Abram, the man of faith. Abram's reconnection with God already shows in his relationship with people, in the way that he handles the problem with Lot, his nephew, concerning the use of the land. It is Abram himself who proposes a peaceful agreement and allows Lot to choose first, as we read in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 13. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right, or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. It was an act of generosity and kindness, indicative of the kind of man Abram was. The fact that Lot chose the easiest and best part for himself, the well-watered plain, as we read in verses 10 and 11, without any concern about the wickedness of his future neighbours, as we read in verse 13, reveals something about his greediness and character. The phrase, for himself, reminds us of the antediluvians who also chose for themselves, as we read in Genesis chapter 6 verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. In contrast, Abram's move was an act of faith. Abram did not choose the land, it was given to him by God's grace. Unlike Lot, Abram looked at the land only at God's injunction, as we read in verse 14 of chapter 13. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had departed from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. It is only when Abram separates from Lot that God speaks to him again. In fact, this is the first recorded time in the Bible that God speaks to Abram since his call at Ur. Lift your eyes now, he, we read in verses 14 and 15, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. God then invites Abram to walk on this land as an act of appropriation. In verse 17 we read, Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. The Lord, though, makes it very clear that he, God, is giving it to Abram. It is a gift, a gift of grace, which Abram must appropriate by faith, a faith that leads to obedience. It is the work of God alone that will bring about all that he has promised to Abram here. As we read in Genesis thirteen fourteen to 17 And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And so to finish the day, how can we learn to be kind and generous to others, even when they aren't that way to us? Wednesday, May 4, The Babel Coalition Read Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 to 17. What is significant about this war taking place just after the gift of the promised land? What does this story teach us about Abram? Genesis 14, beginning at verse 1. Now war filled the land. Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elasa, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, fought against Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shimba, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, later called Zoar. These kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela 
mobilized their armies in Sidham Valley, that is, the Valley of the Dead Sea. For twelve years they had all been subject to King Chedoloma, but now in the thirteenth year they rebelled. One year later, Chedoloma and his allies arrived and the slaughter began, for they were victorious over the following tribes at the place indicated, the Rephaim at Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in the plain of Cariathium, the Horites in Mount Seir, as far as El Paran at the edge of the desert. Then they swung around to En Mishpat, later called Kadesh, and destroyed the Amalekites and also the Amorites living in Hazazan Tamar. But now the other army, that of the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Bela, or Zoah, unsuccessfully attacked Chedoloma and his allies as they were in the Dead Sea Valley, four kings against five. As it happened, the valley was full of asphalt pits, and as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some slipped into the pits, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then the victors plundered Sodom and Gomorrah, and carried off all their wealth and food, and went on their homeward way, taking with them Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom, and all he owned. One of the men who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was camping among the oaks belonging to Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and Ana, Abram's allies. When Abram learned that Lot had been captured, he called together the men born into his household, 318 of them all, and chased after the retiring army as far as Dan. He divided his men and attacked during the night from several directions and pursued the fleeing army to Hobah, north of Damascus, and recovered everything, the loot that had been taken, his relative Lot, and all of Lot's possessions, including the women and other captives. As Abram returned from his strike against Chedoloma and the other kings at the valley of Sheva, later called King's Valley, the king of Sodom came out to meet him. This is the first war narrated in the scriptures. As we read in verse 2, fought against Bera, king of Sodom, Bisha, king of Gomorrah, Shina, king of Admah, Shemba, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, later called Zoah. The coalition of four armies from Mesopotamia and Persia against the other coalition of five Canaanite armies included the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, we read about that in verse 8, suggest a large conflict. The reason for this military operation has to do with the fact that the Canaanite peoples had rebelled against their Babylonian suzerains, as we read in verses 4 and 5. For twelve years they had all been subject to King Chedoloma, but now in the thirteenth year they rebelled. One year later Chedoloma and his tribes arrived, and the slaughter began, for they were victorious over the following tribes at the places indicated, the Rephaim at Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zeus in Ham, the Emim in the plain of Cariathim, the Horites in Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, at the edge of the desert. Although this story refers to a specific historical conflict, the timing of this global war, just after God's gift of the promised land to Abram, gives this event a particular spiritual significance. The involvement of so many peoples from the country of Canaan suggests that the issue at stake in this conflict was sovereignty over the land. Ironically, the camp of Abram, the truly interested party, because he is the only true owner of the land, is the only force that remains outside of the conflict, at least at first. The reason for Abram's neutrality is that, for Abram, the promised land was not acquired through the force of arms or through the wisdom of political strategies. Abram's kingdom was God's gift. The only reason Abram will intervene is the fate of his nephew Lot, who was taken prisoner in the course of the battles, as we read in verses 12 and 13. Let's have another look at that. Taking with them Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom and all he owned. One of the men who escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was camping among the oaks belonging to Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and Ana, Abram's allies. In the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 139, we read, 
Abraham, dwelling in peace in the oak groves at Mamre, learned from one of the fugitives the story of the battle and the calamity that had befallen his nephew. He had cherished no unkind memory of Lot's ingratitude. All his affection for him was awakened, and he determined that he should be rescued. Seeking, first of all, divine counsel, Abraham prepared for war. End of quote. But Abraham does not confront the whole coalition. In what must have been a quick and nocturnal commando operation, he attacks only the camp where Lot was held prisoner. Lot is saved, thus this faithful man of God also showed great courage and fortitude. No doubt his influence in the region grew, and people saw the kind of man he was, and learned something more of the God whom he served. And so to finish today, what kind of influence do our actions have on others? What kind of message are we sending about our faith by our actions? Thursday, May 5. The Tithe of Melchizedek. Read Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 24, and Hebrews 7, 1 to 10. Who was Melchizedek? Why did Abraham give his tithe to this priest who seems to appear out of nowhere? Genesis 14, beginning at verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich except only when the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me, Ana, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. And Hebrews 7, 1 to 10, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginnings of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually." Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. The sudden appearance of the mysterious Melchizedek is not out of place. After Abram had been thanked by the Canaanite kings, he now thanks this priest, a thankfulness revealed by his paying his tithe to him. Melchizedek comes from the city of Salem, which means peace, an appropriate message after the turmoil of war. The component Sedek, T-S-E-D-E-K, or justice, in the name of Melchizedek, appears in contrast to the name of the king of Sodom, Berah, 
in evil, and Gomorrah, Bersha, in wickedness, probably surnames for what they represent, as we read in Genesis 14 verse 2, that they made war with Bera king of Sodom, Bersha king of Gomorrah, Shinab king of Admah, Shemabah king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. Melchizedek appears after the reversal of the violence and evil represented by the other Canaanite kings. This passage also contains the first biblical reference to the word priest, as we read in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. The association of Melchizedek with God Most High in Genesis 14.18, whom Abram calls his own God in Genesis 14.22, clearly indicates that Abram saw him as priest of the God Abram served. Melchizedek is, however, not to be identified with Christ. He was God's representative among the people of that time. And there's extensive quotes from Ellen White in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 1092 and 1093, if you have a copy of that. Melchizedek officiates indeed as a priest. He serves bread and wine, an association that often implies the use of fresh-pressed grape juice, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 13. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. And Second Chronicles chapter 31 and verse 5. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. This reappears in the context of the giving of the tithes in Deuteronomy 14 verse 23, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. In addition, he extends blessing to Abram in Genesis 14 and verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Abram, meanwhile, gave him a tithe of all, as we read in verse 20 of chapter 14. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. This was as a response to God the Creator, the possessor of heaven and earth, as we've just read in verse 19. This title alludes to the introduction of the creation story in Genesis 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, where the phrase heavens and earth means totality or all. As such, the tithe is understood as an expression of gratitude to the Creator who owns everything. As we read in Hebrews 7 verses 2 to 6, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them receives tithes from Abraham, and blessed him who had the promises. And we'll compare this with Genesis chapter 28 and verse 22. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you.
paradoxically, the tithe is understood by the worshipper not as a gift to God, but as a gift from God, because God gives us everything to begin with. And so to finish today, why is the act of returning tithe a powerful indicator of faith as well as a great faith-building act? Friday, May 6. From the book Reflecting Christ, page 205, Ellen White writes, Christ Church is to be a blessing, and its members are to be blessed as they bless others. The object of God in choosing a people before all the world was not only that he might adopt them as his sons and daughters, but that through them he might confer on the world the benefits of divine illumination. When the Lord chose Abraham, it was not simply to be the special friend of God, but to be a medium of the precious and peculiar privileges the Lord desired to bestow upon the nations. He was to be a light amid the moral darkness of his surroundings. Whenever God blesses his children with truth and light, it is not only that they may have the gift of eternal life, but that those around them may also be spiritually enlightened. Ye are the salt of the earth, and when God makes his children salt, it is not only for their own preservation, but that they may be agents in preserving others. Do you shine as living stones in God's building? We have not the genuine religion unless it exerts a controlling influence upon us in every business transaction. We should have practical godliness to weave into our life work. We should have the transforming grace of Christ upon our hearts. We need a great deal less of self and more of Jesus. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. In light of the blessing of Abram, I will bless you and you shall be a blessing in Genesis 12 verse 2, what does it mean to be blessed? How can we, as people who serve the same God as did Abram, be a blessing to others? 2. What was wrong in Abram's half-lie regarding his sister-wife? What is worse? Lying or saying some truth while still at the same time technically lying. And three, read again Genesis 14 verses 21 to 23, Abram's response to the offer of the king of Sodom. Why did he respond as he did? And what important lesson can we take from this story? Would not Abraham have been justified had he decided to take what the king had offered? Genesis 14, verse 21. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled A Dream Marriage and it's by Yulia Bondarenko. The day Ruth took her first step toward becoming a missionary was when she gave her life to Jesus and was baptised while in the seventh grade in the United States. In the eighth grade, she was asked to clean her Seventh day Adventist church. She knew nothing about cleaning churches, so instead she sat at the piano. As she played and sang about her saviour, she imagined people from various countries sitting in the pews and a prayerful desire formed in her mind to marry a man who would play and sing with her. But who? When she was 15, Ruth watched her newly married sister visiting home from her honeymoon slip into her wedding gown, put her hands over her eyes and sob. 
Ruth resolved that a similar situation would not happen to her and started to make a list of desirable traits in her future husband. Her mother, learning about the list, wisely said, Ruth, you also have to become the kind of woman whom that man might want. Ruth prayerfully began to seek to acquire these traits that she expected in her husband. But who? Just before attending Andrews University, Ruth briefly was engaged, but she broke it off. A few months later, she ended another relationship after learning that the man was dating someone else at the same time. That winter, Ruth was in the women's residence hall waiting to go caroling when a friend exclaimed, "'There's Emil Muldrick! Let's get into his car!' Who? Ruth asked. Don't you know? Her friend replied. He sings, plays the organ, and wants to be a pastor. Ruth thought, that's who. For the next few hours, Ruth sang soprano and Emil sang tenor. She felt a new joy in her heart and couldn't stop looking at his eyes. She believed that eyes are the window to the heart, and his eyes were so kind and pure. Emile returned Ruth's gaze as they sang, and the next evening he called for a date. Today, Emile and Ruth Muldrick have been married nearly 60 years and have served God in more than 15 countries, singing and playing musical instruments as missionaries. Emile plays 12 instruments, including the saw and auto harp. The couple has visited Ukraine alone ten times, conducting marriage and English language classes and Bible meetings. As Ruth remembers the day she sang and played in the empty church, she praises God for fulfilling her dream. I did sing and play around the world, so God answered my prayers, she said. And there's a photograph of the two of them there. This mission story illustrates spiritual mission objective number seven of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. To help youth and young adults place God first and exemplify a biblical worldview. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.